Tonight, I'm delighted to have with us the Reverend Dr. Karis Walsh to introduce the poetry, theology, and spirituality of a giant, the famous Welsh poet and mystic R.S. Thomas. Karis is a former therapist. She is ordained in the Anglican Church and currently works in the Diocese of Peterborough, where she oversees the training of curates. She also works with the National Ministry Team, which involves her in the selection of candidates for ordination training. And she's had a long-standing interest in the work of the poet R.S. Thomas. Her doctorate was on Thomas, and out last year came a devotional book introducing his poetry for Advent, entitled Frequencies of God. So tonight I'll be introducing, uh, interviewing indeed, Karis, and to structure our conversation, Karis and I have chosen a number of Thomas's poems to share during this evening. So we'll aim to talk for about 50 minutes and then afterwards we'll pause for questions and answers and we'll aim to end by about 9 p.m. So Karis, a really warm welcome. Thank you very much, Mark. Lovely to be here. Thank you. Uh, so I'll stop my screen share because I think soon you're going to be sharing with us. But before we do that, mm -hmm. uh, let me ask you, uh, I, I alluded to it in the introduction, but you have had a long standing and quite personal interest in RS, haven't you? Could you just say a little bit about that? Yes, um, RS Thomas became a very significant figure to me in my own journey of faith, really. I, I came from a particular tradition in which over a number of years I found it increasingly difficult to hang my faith together. Um, and my, my experience was of um, an expression of faith which was in a way quite um, flat and lacked resonance, which I know isn't the main thing for, for, for many people, but increasingly uh, I discovered that I needed to find somebody who could show me what it meant to doubt and who could show me what it would mean to have lots of questions and to struggle periodically and over periods of time, keep on um, iterating and reiterating their relationship with God. And when I came across R.S. Thomas, he was somebody who invited me into a brand new faith landscape, a brand new emotional landscape of faith. And I discovered in his kind of misery guts way that I could, I, I, I felt met. <laughs> <laughs> So he's been a very important figure for me for about 30 years now. I, I love the, what was the expression you used, the language of doubt? What, what do you mean about that? Yes, I mean, lots of people see Thomas as a doubting person. I see him as somebody whose faith was so kind of, I suppose, so robust. His God was so much, you know, older, uglier and hairier than every, other people's God that you could really... You could really ask questions that you might not be able to ask in, in other contexts. So what can look like doubt, I experienced is swimming in the, such a degree of faith that you could ask and say anything you wanted to, and it was okay. Okay. We, we, we were already kind of uh, brushing up against what sounds to me like mysticism, really, uh, mm -hmm. how what we might think of as absence could actually be the place where you encounter this great mystery called God. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when did you first come across R.S.? Oh, I suppose it was the early 90s I came across him. And he was one of those poets who I used to have their poetry by the side of the bed. And I, I had this feeling, T.S. Eliot was the same at the time. I had this feeling that if I, if I dared to open this poetry, it would change my life. And so it took me a while <laughs> to do that. And, and lo, it came to pass, you know, and discovering this, this great poet really did change things for me. And also there was something about him which sang to my soul. I'm, I'm a sort of um, uh, Anglo-Welsh background and there was something about his character which reflected um, the, the kind of the mixture of the North Walian and the Anglicised, in my case, English, in his case, Anglicised Welsh character. And it was like, it was like coming home on so many different levels. He is quintessentially miserable. I mean, he's famously awful, really, isn't he? Personally, he must be a very <laughs> difficult man. You, you didn't find any of that off-putting? Um, occasionally, yes. Um, <laughs> and sometimes you'd read stuff about him or hear stories about him and think, why am I spending so much of my life reading this guy's poetry and swilling about in his world? And then you'd stumble across a poem, poem of his and think, <laughs> 
that's why. That's why I'm doing it. It was like um, a, an, an encounter with God when you read his poetry. So I didn't mind that much. And actually, the more I went on studying him and meeting people who knew him, sadly, I never met him myself, meeting people who knew him, you kind of realise that this sort of curmudgeonly front wasn't the whole story. It was partly true, certainly, but also a little bit of a, well, I, I say a marketing exercise, that's probably unfair, but I think it was it was um, an identity he slightly cultivated, mm-hmm. so he didn't have to deal with all comers who came knocking on his door. Yeah, and uh, so you did your doctorate on him. Um, very, very brief thumbnail, what were you trying to do? I was looking at, I mean, officially the doctorate was in Christian spirituality, but what I was trying to do was look at how his theology and poetry, um, or his poetry became a place which expressed his theology, and as a consequence his poetry was an outworking of his spirituality, and in particular I was looking at how he understood the world sacramentally, his sacramental theology, and, and looked at it from two different perspectives really one about the the crafting of sacramentality so how we craft the the sacramental and the other one was the idea that he encountered the world as a naturally sacramental place sort of full of epiphanies so it was those two two threads really I was looking at okay so this sort of idea that that matter becomes a window through which you can see God Um, this could be nature or other forms of matter Mm -hmm. OK, well, we better talk about R.S. Thomas. Give, me a, give us a potted biography. And, and we have to start with what does the R.S. stand for? Because for years I had no <laughs> idea. I'd, I'd hear his name quoted in sermons, R.S. Thomas. But, yeah. so, so who was R.S. Thomas? R.S. Thomas was Ronald Stuart Thomas. But um, probably a slightly typical R.S. Thomas thing. He was not called, he was not christened Stuart. He adopted <laughs> the, the name Stuart because he thought a second um, initial sounded good. <laughs> So he was actually Ronald, Ronald Thomas and he became Ronald Stuart Thomas. Um, so that's who he was. He was born in Cardiff in 1913. He was um, brought up in a heavily anglicised um, Anglican family. His mother was an anglicised Welsh woman. His father was a very, very culturally Welsh Welshman and he was a merchant seaman. And uh, this this was a, a source of enormous tension for him. He didn't have a brilliant relationship with his mother, but he was drawn to her church world and her poetic world. His father, he absolutely adored. Um, but poor old R.S. Thomas couldn't speak Welsh, which was his father's native language, until he was an adult. So there was this sense for him of, of tension within him. But most of his growing up was um, an Anglesey, and that was after a few years sort of wandering around the ports of England uh, because his father was a merchant seaman and the family travelled around. Uh, and after many years of growing up in Anglesey, he went off to the University of Bangor, where he studied classics and from there, he went to um, St. Michael Slandaff to um, study theology, and he was called into the church. But he only had a year there before he was whisked off to a curacy. Um, uh, yeah, he, he was kind of plucked out to serve in a particular curacy. If anybody has ever read the book Bad Blood by Lorna Sage, um, who it's, it's a wonderful a piece of writing. It's about her church history. She's now a, a late professor of English. Um, her grandfather, who sounded like one of the most horrendous people you would ever wish to meet, was a clergyman who was Thomas's training incumbent. Um, and then Thomas spent the next 50 years um, as a parish priest and also as a poet. Um, I think you've got a map, haven't you? you I have. Like, would you like to see the map? Yeah, let's pop up the PowerPoint. Um, so, okay. so, so he actually comes from South Wales. He's a, he's a sort of valleys boy, but actually he gravitates to the north, doesn't he? Yes. And I, I, mean, I remember reading some of his poetry. There's quite a kind of um, contrast between the, the valleys and, and the, uh, the mountains. Uh, yes. and a moral contrast, I think. I'm sorry, this is quite a grainy picture. This is uh, Thomas at his most grumpy. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, he, he, well, I say he wasn't so much a valleys boy as a South Walian. He didn't live in the valleys, really, but he was very much, he was Cardiff rooted. This map takes us on his journey of Wales, really. That's R.S. Thomas in his sort of middle, middle years. Um, and that book by uh, Tony Brown, who is a great, 
Well, he's actually not a fan of Thomas's religious writing. He's a fan of Thomas's political writing, which is another theme of his. Mm. But that's worth uh, getting as an intro. Manavon here, which is the purple, uh, was his first incumbency. Um, and he travelled from Manavon to Egloisvach, uh, as you can see further west. And then ultimately he went right to the westernmost tip at Avadaron. And this was a very um, distinct journey he took. Uh, he was in search of his Welsh identity. Uh, he was definitely a Welshman but he spoke with a cut glass English accent all the way through his life. He didn't learn Welsh till he was an adult when he was living in, in Manavon. And these areas have all got very particular poetic characters to them. So the years he spent in Manavon, then in Eglouisvach, then in Abadaron have very different poetic characters to, to them. In Manavon, he wrote a, primarily about the uh, Welsh hill farmers, whom he rather sadly called the peasants, which was mm. not very pleasant. But he wrote about them. They inspired him. First of all, he, he railed against them because they didn't get stained glass and stuff like that. And then over time, he realised that he had to fit himself to their context. And he started to love them and to admire them. And he wrote about uh, a character, a, a, a composite character of the Welsh hills, whom he named Iago Pradach. And um, Pradach was a very significant poetic figure for him. And in the end, Thomas was able to say, rather than um, old men gobbing by the fire, which is how he used to describe them at first, he, he wrote, arrived at this point where he was able to say, your name too is written in the book of life. So it was a very important formative time for him. And then he went west in this um, imagination that the further west he went, the more Welsh, he could get. <laughs> um, and he went to Eglouisvach, and that was in, in the 50s, and um, thought, this is going to be great. I, I've really hit my Welshness here. And he found himself in a context which was mostly retired English army majors. And so it kind of, it was a huge disappointment to him. Um, but this was a, a decade in which he started to write about what it meant to be a religious poet. And he started to explore his craft. He started to explore his faith in a new way. And my reading of Thomas is that this was a fallow period in the truest sense of the word, in that he um, he embedded himself much more in the interior world and did some quite serious exploration. And his re religious poetry starts around here. Then finally, his final incumbency was up here in Abadaron, which... Um, I mean, as, as you know, it is on the furthest westernmost tip of Wales. And it was when he got here that he felt he had come home. He felt at this point that he had reached the end of his personal pilgrimage, as he put it. And it was at this point when he was ministering amongst, well, amongst Welsh speaking people, could speak Welsh all the time, albeit with a very strong English accent. He felt now I can let go of all that identity stuff. And I can focus on what matters to me, which is matters of God and the universe. And that's when his explosion of religious poetry took place, which is in the, in the late 60s. It began into the 70s to the point of his retirement. He carried on writing poetry after he'd retired, um, but he stayed living in the same sort of area. So he retired 1978, survived till 2000. Uh, he, he was... I mean, two things he's quite famous for. One is his support for Welsh nationalism, which occasionally was rather unguardedly um, appeared to uh, accept violence of, I think, sort of firebombing of English houses. I'm yeah. quite sure how deep that went. And the other thing was that he was he was very anti-technology. So his son talks about him living in sort of unheated house with with nothing electric around. Yeah. Hermit-like existence with with both wives. He's married twice, wasn't he? He was married twice. And yes, he was famously anti-technology. And that was a theme in his poetry. Well, it was partly a theme, I mean, certainly a theme in some of his, oddly, some of his poetry about the Welsh hill farmers. He seemed not to recognise that technology could actually do them some good. So the tractor, fairly basic one might think. But for Thomas, that was a sign 
that um, the important old days of Welsh hill farming was behind them. And the tractor he saw as uh, being um, an unwelcome presence. So he wrote this poem called Come Volan on a Tractor, which is all about uh, a Welsh hill farmer who he sees as being a kind of um, uh, proud tractor driver and how terrible this was for the soul. But of course, it was incredibly helpful for the hill farmers. But as time went by, he really struggled more and more with technology. Um, when I, on my many visits up to, to Bangor to, to think about all matters R.S. Thomas, I spent one time with um, Canon Donald Ulchin, who was a canon at Bangor University. And he, I remember him saying to me that he thought he knew Thomas. He thought Thomas spent about the last 20 years of his life trying to find a language for science and technology because he recognised its place in the world, but fundamentally struggled with it. He saw it as being more about destruction than creativity. Mm. Let, let's let's do some poems. Come on, let's let's dive in. Uh, we, we're going to pick about five or six poems uh, from uh, RS's corpus. Uh, we're going to read one each. Harris will read for us, and then we're going to discuss it. Uh, we thought we'd start with how he uses language. So um, you've chosen the gap. So Karis, do you want to read for us the gap and then let's have a conversation about what does this reveal about Thomas the poet and the way that he uses language? Yes, by all means, see if I can find the gap. The gap is um, from uh, the 90, late 1970s. I've chosen an image of the Tower of Babel, as you can see. I'm going to read the gap. God woke, but the nightmare did not recede. Word by word, the tower of speech grew. He looked at it from the air he reclined on. One word more, and it would be on a level with him. Vocabulary would have triumphed. He measured the thin gap with his mind. No, no, no wider than that, but the nearness persisted. How to live with the fact, that was the feat now. How to take his rest on the edge of a chasm a word could bridge. He leaned over and looked in the dictionary they used. There was the blank still by his name of the same order as the territory between them. The verbal hunger for the thing in itself. And the darkness that is a God's blood swelled in him and he let it to make the sign in the space on the page that is in all languages a nun, that is the grammarian's torment and the mystery at the cell's core and the equation that will not come out and is the narrowness that we stare over into the eternal silence that is the repose of God. I'm, I'm hearing huge amounts about distance between God and us, and, and the ambiguous way in which language helps to mediate that difference. Mm. Am I reading this poet right? This poem right? I think that's utterly fair, and I kind of I, I both want to agree with it uh -huh. and to take issue with it. Go on. I mean, this is only ever my reading of it, so please feel free to read it differently. <laughs> For me, I mean, obviously there are all these kind of Babel-esque allusions, and I love the juxtaposition at the beginning. God woke. And at the end, the repose of God. So you get this sort of oh, startled God waking up and suddenly discovering that humanity has crept closer and we're there, basically. Uh, word by word, we're kind of climbing the ladder to God. And he's looking down at us. I know it's terribly anthropomorphized and thinking, oh, no, one more word. And they've got me. They've got me. They've named me. They've hooked me. They've, you know, defined me. Uh, and so, of course, well, of course, in this poem, what God is doing is panicking. First of all, you can tell from the language. If you look at the two columns, the foot on the page is one long column. But the, here, the column on the left, the lines are slightly shorter. Mm -hmm. The language is slightly more rushed. There's a bit more sibilant, a bit more short sound. And so you get this emotional sense of <gasps> panic. And even this, no, no, no wider than that, but the nearness persisted. So first of all, we've got panicking. 
how can I post God panicking? How can I possibly rest when humanity is on my tail? And then in the second half of the poem, you get slightly elongated sounds, dictionary, territory, you get more plosives than sibilants. So the sounds start changing and he does maintain the distance. But for me, what he's doing is he's maintaining a distance deliberately. It's not to be cruel to us. It's not to keep us away from him. But it's almost like God's thinking, if they get me, they have named me and the search is over. We may as well all pack up and go home. But what can he do? He can maintain the gap. He can maintain the space. And in maintaining the space in the way God chooses to do it in this poem, we are both connected with God and kept distance. So it's this sort of almost shimmering moment of being caught by God and kept away. And the way he does it, of course, in this is with this great imagery of God. You can imagine this the blood swells and God lets the blood. So you get this dollop of blood in the dictionary. And what do we do with that? It's basically, it's not well, basically, it's a symbol replacing a word. And it could be a word, capital W, replacing a word, baby W. So you get this um, extraordinary image of God maintaining distance, but drawing us close all at the same time to make a sign in the space on the page. The sign is offered rather than the word so that we are all of us, God and humanity, are relieved from being hooked by fact. And if we're relieved from being hooked by fact, the search continues. The space is held and we are still caught by God and God can rest. So that's my reading of it, that, yeah, the gap is maintained, but we're also held and connected by a symbol which bleeds into the gap rather than a word which pins us down. So this is, this, so this is a kind of graced distance that, that is generous to us, which is kind of ironic because you'd think that spirituality would be all about the instant presence of God. But so in this, it suggests that actually, if you really want to know God, actually, you, you need that gap. It's not a gap in which God totally evacuates because there is this mysterious presence. The, the cell, the, the equation that won't come up, the fact that you keep on stumbling across this mystery. So it's not a mystery that's totally distant, but nor is it kind of obvious that God is right there in your face. And it's not yeah. all the time. Yeah, and it, it's it's right, it reaches right into the really ancient tradition of apophatic mm. theology, which is it's not emotionless, it's not a kind of shrug of the shoulders. Ooh, well, we just don't know, do we? There is this great emotional sense of yearning at the heart of it. And I find it interesting. Thomas is sometimes seen as quite an unemotional poet. And he said himself, I'm not very good at this love stuff. I leave that to my wife, is what he said in one of his interviews. But there is this huge emotional um, component to the search, to the quest in his poetry, which I find, even for this kind of misery guts type bloke that you can hear about this profound spiritual hunger is i find compelling and just to point out the obvious he, he doesn't use rhyme very much uh, and certainly not end rhyme and and and, and i've always been slightly confused he, he'll often use a kind of paragraph so at the top of your right hand column he leaned what's going on there why does he sort of break up things like that is it is it to make me pause when i read it or yeah, I think, I mean, what there's one um, formulation on this page, which is one word more and, and that's that's a font thing. Mm. Um, so forgive that. But if he does this kind of thing, if he breaks like this, it's very deliberate. There is often a, a kind of a break in emotion, a break in sense or a break in mood. And if you look at an R.S. Thomas poem and the way it's laid out on a page, you're getting, you're kind of getting information, but also it does create natural rhythms of reading, which you know you can't help abide by. And the sounds, as I intimated earlier, the sounds he uses create uh, contribute to the rhythm and the meaning and the sense of it too. And he does a lot of writing in sonnet structure, um, and he does it very deliberately. He writes it very deliberately so that around the volta you get a, a kind of a mood change. So mm -hmm. he. He was very um, deliberate in how he used his language. Mm. 
Mm. Okay, so let, let's turn and look at how um, RS approaches God. And you've already hinted that we you know, there are kind of two contrasting poles. On the one hand, we can have moments of closeness to God, uh, but then that's, that's set within kind of distance. So um, let, let's examine those in turn. I think we were going to start with the more, or do you want to start with via negativa? Oh, sorry, I don't mind. That's my fault. Let's start and with let's the do, more. Let's do it. Oh, yeah, we'll do the more. So um, uh, let's read the more. Okay, the more is here. Um, the more. This is from a collection called Pieta, which was a 1960s collection. And that is indeed a Welsh more. It was like a church to me. I entered it on soft foot, breath held like a cap in the hand. It was quiet. What God was there made himself felt, not listened to, in clean colours, that brought, a, that brought a moistening of the eye in movement of the wind over grass. There were no prayers said, but the stillness of the heart's passions, that was praise enough, and the mind's session of its kingdom. I walked on, simple and poor, while the air crumbled and broke on me generously as bread. Do you want to tell us about God through the lens of the moor as R.S. sees him? Oh, gosh. It's one of those poems that makes me go, oh, when I read it. Um, this is one, of, in many ways, one of his most accessible poems. But yeah. I say that knowing also that as soon as you go into the language, there is a... Um, an emotional depth to it and a linguistic depth, which still slightly defies um, meaning in a way. I mean, there is one obvious sense. For Thomas, the natural world was always the most um, obvious place to him of where he found God. He only had to walk into the hillside. He only had to watch the birds and he would be in the presence of God. So the natural world was, was his was his um, natural home. He was often spoken of as being a nature mystic. And he said, I'm not a nature mystic. I don't worship nature. I worship the God who gave me nature. So when he goes onto the moor, this is a place of encounter. And entering it on soft foot, to me immediately evokes a, scent, a sense of um, profound respect. Mm, it's kind of Moses in the uh, meeting God at Sinai, isn't it, or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's on holy ground and uh, uh, breath held. That's a really beautiful image. So I'm looking at a screen over here, which is why I'm doing. Breath is held like a cap in the hand. So you imagine he would be working amongst people who would go into church and take their hats off and mm. hold it. And this, for him, is what's happening. This moment of um, adoration and veneration and respect catches his breath. So breath is held like a cap in the hand. It's quiet. Now, this is interesting about, well, it's all interesting to me. Uh, what, what God was there made himself felt, felt, not listened to. So we've got a bit of a subclause there. So the senses are all messed up here. God is felt, not listened to in clean colours. God is felt in clean colours that, that they bring a moistening to the eye. So there is a sense that what he's doing here is evoking a profoundly sensual world, but one in which all the senses talk to each other. So that there is movement, there is colour, there is wind, and there is emotion all wrapped up together. And then again here, this is one of those poems in which we have a break. So in movement of the wind over grass, break. There were no prayers said. But the stillness, oh, this is beautiful, but the stillness of the heart's passions. This is something he comes back to. It's one of those themes for Thomas, that when we are still, when our mind stills, when our impulses, our instincts, our passions, still we are praising God. It's about being prepared to um, abandon 
our habitual kingdom. That's praise. And the mind's session of its kingdom, the mind stops, stops doing it. I'm the boss of the universe stuff. And then we end up with this beautiful language about this is a man stripped of hubris at this point. I walked on simple and poor. He's like um, an itinerant um, preacher or something. I walked on simple and poor whilst the air crumbled and broke on me generously as bread. Suddenly, this isn't just a moorland. This is a Eucharistic presence. Everything around him tells him who God is in this moment of encounter and humility, all through the experience of accessing the moor. So for me, the God of this poem is... um, a mixture of extraordinarily benign and also, I mean, this is, for me, this is an imminent and transcendent God, the God to be encountered in the the, the wind and weather, but also in the moment by moment movement of a man walking through a landscape. Let's, we, 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 to get to, we've got to go through all of these. But sorry, let, sorry. No, no, that's absolutely fine. Let, let's have a look at Via Negativa because that kind of, that, really turns this around and looks at, at experience God from a rather different perspective, doesn't it? Yeah. Now, um, when I click, I don't know which direction this is going to go in. So what I'm going to do is go like yeah, this. We need Whoops, to go back. Negative. Here we go. There we go. Whoops. Be a negative. Oh, dear. Sorry. Hang on. So a we've, had, we've had the presence of God. Now let's, let's experience Thomas and the, and the absence of God. Yeah. Frequencies is a later collection. Frequencies is from the the late 70s. So this is about 12 years after the moor. Via negativa. Why no? I never thought other than that God is that great absence in our lives. The empty silence within. The place where we go seeking, not in hope to arrive or find. He keeps the interstices in our knowledge, the darkness between stars. His are the echoes we follow, the footprints he's just left. We put our hands in his side, hoping to find it warm. We look at people and places as though he had looked at them too, but miss the reflection. A wistful right at the end. (laughs) Yeah. He writes a lot about just missing stuff. Sorry, Mark. Yes, he does. He, he, there's a poem where he talks about walking into the room and just glimpsing God walk out. <laughs> yeah. uh, via negativa? The words? Oh, via negativa. I mean, it's a kind of direct steal from um, the apophatic tradition, the negative way. So uh, Thomas wrote a lot about the negative, the negative way. And of course... Um, It sounds negative, but it's not really. We're drawing straight from the tradition of Dionysius, the Areopagite. So we're 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 drawing straight from the tradition of that uh, probably 5th or 6th century um, Syrian monk who wrote, uh, fascinatingly, I think, wrote at a time when the rest of the world was heresy checking and being very... um, particular about what language we use, because if we didn't use the right language, we might fall into heresy. So Christology was being finely textured at this point. And then in the middle of all this, you get Dionysius the Areopagite, who talks about the mystery of God and who uses a sort of discourse, which which is all about, um, well, we can never know God. Language is the best we can do, but it's totally inadequate. So whatever you say about God, we have to immediately, we have to backtrack on. There's no point saying God is good because all that means is God is good as far as we can understand it. In fact, God is not good in that sense because God is so much better than anything we could ever um, aim for that we have to unsay it. So there is this tradition of saying something, an affirmation, then immediately retracting it in order to impress upon us that God is greater than anything we could possibly affirm about God. So that's one of the hallmarks of the the um, the discourse of the, the negative way, the via negativa. But also embedded in this is the idea 
that in the world, what we commonly experience is not God right there in front of us, but the tracks and traces of the of the um, the God who has run away, apparently, the Deus absconditus. So the idea that whenever we think we're approaching God, we have to keep going because God has already gone. So negative theology is both about how we speak about God or not speak about God, and also how we experience God, that we can experience God on one level, but we are always, always ever so slightly behind God because God is off there somewhere or other. So for Thomas wrote a lot in this tradition. And one of the reasons he, he did it was because um, in the earlier years of his life and ministry, it seems, well, it seems to me that he experienced a lot of voids, a lot of void gap spaces in his world. And over a period of time, he started to wrestle with this more and more. And he arrived at a position, it seems to me, that um, he started to experience the spaces in our world less as voids, but as places of God's action. It's just that God was so mysterious and so beyond that you can't always access God easily. It's a kind of does a fish know it swims in water moment. Mm. This sense of God is so present, so utterly here, that there is a sense in which we experience God as absent. And this poem, to me, is a kind of an expression of all of this. And he starts off saying, why no? So immediately we're in this sort of negative theology world. We start off with a negative. It's as if he's in the middle of a conversation. And you find with Thomas, periodically, he um, writes poems where you think, Who, who's he speaking to? It's as if he's, there's somebody asking him a question. And he said, no, I never thought other than God is that great absence in our lives. Now, for an absence to be a thing, it has to be based on the idea of presence. So this is another feature of negative theology, that as soon as we talk about God's absence, we necessarily bring God before us. You can't say God is not here without making people think about God. So that's one of the characteristics of his language, too. When he says God is absent, God becomes present. So he's saying, I've never thought anything other than God is that great absence in our lives, the empty space within, the place where we go seeking. And this is a, another of his characteristic things. We go seeking for God, not in hope to arrive or find. The theme of seeking without necessarily expecting or hoping to find. Well, it can sound a bit like a council of despair. What's the point of seeking if we don't hope we're going to find? But there is something for me about this. Do, do interrupt me, Mark. I can, I can end up <laughs> rabbiting. But there's something about if we, if we, he had a thing about praying isn't about having an answer. It's about being prepared to launch, launch your prayers and, as they are launched and travel, that is the prayer. So, so it's very him, much a kind of leap of faith kind of thing. It's sort of don't be attached, trust, leap into that yeah. darkness. And God, will catch you. Yeah, mm. and God will catch you. Yeah, and God will, yeah. Yes, I mean, he wouldn't say, and God will catch you. But his assumption would be, if you leap, you're already in God's presence. Mm. That's the thing. And then he says in this, he keeps, he keeps, he maintains the interstices. He keeps the gaps again, the gaps in our knowledge. So he's saying it's, it's got God makes sure we can't always close the gap. We follow the echoes. We follow the footprints. And then this beautiful Thomasy type image. We put our hands in his side, hoping to find it warm. We are constantly reaching out hoping that we will have an encounter with God. So this is, this is doubting Thomas, isn't it? It's just a, but of course, and it's at that minute you think, I'd love to be Thomas to be there. But, but in John's Gospel, what comes is blessed are those who haven't seen. The blessing is on those who haven't had the experience, which I guess is really what he's trying to say. Yeah, so, so much about 
But the, you get when you read it, I find anyway, I mean, it's worth going back and reading these poems and just lingering over them. What you often get is this hugely emotional quality. Mm-hmm. We look at and this sort of um, ref, almost reflective, almost prismatic process. We look at people and places as though he's looked at them. So, you know, you, you look at a Zoom screen, you look at the people here and we don't look at hoping to find God, but we look at hoping to catch a glimpse of the eyes that have looked at it before, which is a beautiful kind of peripheral, barely there image. But we miss the reflection. I, I don't know if you, if you know, I was uh, reading about um, uh, medieval mysticism, about the Song of Songs, and they particularly uh, latched on to the, the chase that happens where the, 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 uh, the beloved loses her lover and she's running through the streets. And there's very much a sense of, of looking for God who's, you know, I had this experience of love, but where's it gone? And, and that causes me to go chase. And that's part of a spirituality. And I, I think that's in here too, as well, isn't it? Yeah. God evacuates the space to draw you on, as it were. Yeah, it's very cloud of unknowing as well. It's the sort of the longing dart of love. It's um, the thing which, which draws us and draws us. Yeah. Mm. Let's have a look at the uh, next poem. I think we've chosen, uh, I'm just checking my notes. Is it in context next? I think it may be. Um, my screen share is doing curious things. So I'll make sure if, if, if in context isn't what comes up next, I'll make sure we get there. No, amen. That's... I think we'll have to go on past amen. We, we, that was our, our padding one. In case we need it, we don't. <laughs> um, I, RS could be incredibly sort of harsh critic of himself. And I think sometimes of other people. Um, mm. Let's have a read of in context. Okay. This is one of my favorites. In context. Again, from frequencies. All my life, I tried to believe in the importance of what Thomas should say now, do next. There was a context in which I lived. Unseen forces acted upon me or made their adjustments in turn. There was a larger pattern we worked at, they on a big loom. I with a small needle drawing the thread through my mind, colouring it with my own thought. Yet a power guided my hand. If an invisible company waited to see what I would do, I, in my own way, asked for direction. So we should journey together a little nearer the accomplishment of the design. Impossible dreamer. All those years, the demolition of the identity proceeded. Fast as the cells constituted themselves, They were replaced. It was not I who lived, but life rather that lived me. There was no developing structure. There were only the changes in the metabolism of a body greater than mine and the dismantling by the self of a self it could not reassemble. Tell us about in context. <laughs> Where um, do you want to start? <laughs> uh, really, I mean, it is, it's a real favourite of mine. And there's, there's always a bit in this poem where I can feel my breath start to go. Oh. Um, and it's this extraordinary moment, three quarters of the way through, mm. where he says, it was not I who lived, but life rather that lived me. And I mean, there is a sense in which there is an obviousness about this, but we will all connect with it in different ways. But I, I think there's something very um, uh, personal and very attractive in the sense that it can hook us, that somewhere many of us probably know what it's like to do all this stuff about being caught up with it matters, my life matters, what I'm doing matters. I'm living in this place. There's stuff happening. You know, there is, we have a sense of God's presence. We have a sense of something happening. There are forces acting upon me. There's a larger pattern. There is something about the share. There is a sort of um, a f- sort of a fantasy of shared agency. It's me and God, and we're doing it together. And that's fine. We'll just do stuff together. We'll rub alongside each other. And if I'm on my small needle weaving away, there is this bigger pattern 
But it's interesting this moment when he says, I with a small needle, drawing the thread through my mind, colouring it with my own thought. So there is this complete conviction that we are shaping and crafting our own design. Now, I don't know the extent to which I'm shaping and crafting my own design, but I, I think there is always this moment when we have a sort of a fantasy about our part in our own lives, whether we either over egg it or under egg it, I'm not sure. But as he goes on, yet, it's one of those moments, there's a break in the page, yet a power guided my hand. So we're getting slightly more into, it's less about my agency, it's something else already going on, the, the poem travels for us. I thought this was going on, yet a power guided my hand. If an invisible company waited to see what I would do, I in my own way asked for direction. So it's not just this shared agency. I'm actually asking for help here. So we should journey together. Then this, this long sentence here where it's almost like he's like a dog going round in a basket to get comfortable. He's trying to get a, a sense of comfort about the shared endeavour. So we should journey together a little nearer the accomplishment of the design. And then this wonderful break, impossible dreamer. And at this point, you start to realise or that he has somewhere sensed that his sense of his own part in his life has probably been faulty. All those years, the demolition of the identity proceeded. Fast as the cells constituted themselves, they were replaced. So this idea we have is a kind of modernist idea in a sense about improvement and development and self-actualization or whatever you want to call it. He's saying, don't be fooled. We're actually subject to something greater than us. And if we're subject to something greater than us, then we are being... Um, Unbuilt, we are being dismantled all the way along. Faster the cells constituted themselves, so we're kind of, you know, physically we're building and building. It's also being replaced. And that's the kind of biological truth that we are both reconstituting and being replaced. And then this huge moment of acceptance and almost abandonment. It was not I who lived, but life that lived me. If it's true that we are always being reshaped in our cells, who's in control? And it's that moment of, I thought it was me, really not. There was no developing structure. There were only the changes of the metabolism of a body greater than mine and this dismantling by the self of a self it could not reassemble. I still find the closing lines of this quite curious because he's playing with agency at this point. The, the double reference to self. Mm. Yeah. yeah. We are dismantling ourselves, but in so doing, that, well, that's just, that's just life. We're doing that. But in so doing, as we are dismantled, we don't reassemble in the same way. So one of, the, one of the things I love about this poem is it strips away human fantasy. Mm. But it also leaves us with these questions about who are we? Mm. What is the, you know, biology takes over, yeah. but what is agency in all of this? But inevitably, somewhere in the middle of all this, we are called to let go of this fantasy. I was going to say, so this, this leads into a spirituality where prayer, which is about or probably sitting, being still, open hands, let go. Your life is not about you. And in losing it, you may find something. Um, fundamentally about letting go, not being in control and that being OK. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it, there is something really glorious about that in the middle of the lives we hang on to so desperately, which I totally get. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a look at the last poem we've chosen. Um, uh, if anybody's heard of Thomas's poetry, I'm sure they will have heard the poem, uh, The Kingdom, which we're, we're going to disappoint everyone by not reading. 
but you wanted to read uh, Imperatives of the Instinct, yes. which shares that same Thomas theme of the reversal, God's reversal of values, sort of the turning upside down of reality. So um, let's finish on uh, Imperatives of the Instinct, and then we'll and then we'll stop, and people can ask some questions. And yeah. if we need be, we've got a poem up our sleeve, and let, let's see what happens. So. This is a poem that was entirely new to me when I read your book, but I'd not, I'd not read it before. Mm -hmm. This is from a collection called Counterpoint, which is from 1919. Counterpoint is a collection which is fundamentally, it's like, um, it's uh, a bit like a, a spiritual history of humanity. It's, it's in four sections. So the imperatives of the instincts. As I read it, ask yourself the question where you think the heart of the poem is. The imperatives of the instincts in abeyance, heart and mind at one in their contemplation of the ripening apple never to fall from the topmost branches of truth's tree. A site for the repair of promises that were broken, for picking up pieces of the smashed dream. It has the freshness of mushrooms, proof of the whiteness darkness can bring forth. It is the timeless place, the unaccommodated moment, an interval in the performance of an unheard music. Do not believe those who have been everywhere but here. Tell the poor of the world there is nothing to pay, no distance to travel, that they are invited to the marriage of here and now. That the crystal in which they look, grey with foreboding as the moon with earth's shadow, has this as its far side, turning necessarily towards us with the reversal of our values. You asked about the heart of this as I was listening. I, I felt I'll venture if in case I get it wrong. <laughs> I wonder, and for me, the, the, the poem shifts do not believe and then tell the poor. That that seems to me that a turning point here. Um, yeah. Is that what you were grasping for when you asked the question? <laughs> well, I think that's um that is that's thematically that's a really important moment. So we're being taken through these six verses. It's as if we're being talked down. For, uh, for me, I mean, we will all react differently. Mm. For me, the absolute heart of the poem, which sounds a bit tricksy, is here. It's in the gap. It's in the space between the third and the fourth stanzas. So thematically, yes, it shifts around here. But I think he, what he's doing, this is my reading, what he's doing here is he's drawing us to a, a still point. So the poem starts with the imperatives of the instincts and you, you know, think of your everything buzzing away, mm. but immediately the imperatives of the instincts in abeyance, oh, we drop heart and mind at one in the contemplation of the ripening apple never to fall from the topmost branches. So it's as if at this moment, we're being invited just to stop there is the ripening apple, and it is a source of wisdom, but we're not going to pick it. We're going to allow it to keep growing and to keep ripening. An interesting blend of Newton's apple with uh, with the uh, Garden of Eden, isn't it? Sort of knowledge and also sort of sin. Nothing's happened. You know, it's innocence in both. There senses. is an innocence. Yeah, there is an innocence and something ripening towards mm. yes, towards wisdom. And we're being nudged. And he doesn't say what the site is, a site for the repair of promises, but we're being slightly nudged as we go. They're like little spoilers. A site for the repair of promises that were broken for picking up pieces of the smashed dream. Where are we being taken? He's taking us somewhere. And we're going somewhere, which is a place for the repair of promises that are broken and picking up pieces of the smashed dream it presumably the site it has the freshness of mushrooms and the image he uses here proof of the whiteness darkness can bring forth 
So That's an astonishing line, isn't it? And, uh, and very close to exactly this via negativa idea that actually it's the mid darkness that you'll you'll see something else. Yeah, it's uh, it's hugely. I mean, who thought mushrooms could be so redemptive? But it's this sort of sense of something growing in the dark, beautifully springing forth whiteness. Yeah, absolutely. And then we're being nudged further. It is the timeless place. Oh. The unaccommodated moment. And we're, in, we're deep in T.S. Eliot land here. The mm. unaccommodated moment. And in this, for me, this is the space where we are right in the heart of this interval, this unaccommodated moment. This is the place where the instincts have no value. We are at rest. There is wisdom there is this sense of redemption right at the heart of this. The interval in the performance of an unheard music. It's doubly, doubly silent. An interval in the performance of unheard music. <laughs> <laughs> so then we get into this gear shift, thematic gear shift. Do not believe. It's as if he's suddenly turning to the camera Mm. don't believe it do not believe those who have been everywhere but here don't believe people who have not been in the unaccommodated moment and this is where we get to mark was saying earlier about the kingdom this is where we get into the kingdom territory tell the poor of the world there is nothing to pay no distance to travel so as in the kingdom where actually god's kingdom is immediate present here it's about perspective as much as anything the same with this poem this unaccommodated moment this interval where the clutter of the world drops away and we have this moment of redemption this is for all of us do not believe those who've been everywhere but here tell the poor of the world there is nothing to pay no distance to travel that they are invited to the marriage of here and now. And then we have these beautiful images at the end, which I don't know what they all mean. Sometimes with Thomas, we don't know what everything means. But I would encourage anybody just to see what arrives when you read it. Whenever I read this, something new arrives. Something There is something so powerful about his language, something new can arrive that the crystal in which they look, gray with foreboding. So they might look in the mirror of their own lives and it's gray and it's dark and it's miserable. Gray with, forebo uh, with foreboding as the moon with earth's shadow has this as its far side. And here we come into the kingdom again, turning necessarily towards us with the reversal of our values. Thomas, often in his poetry, is encouraging us to get a new perspective, to allow ourselves to see the world differently. So for those for whom looking in the mirror is a dark, dark place because of whatever, what we discover if we look into this moment is that our values are flipped around, turning necessarily towards us, with the reversal of our values. Again, I find it really interesting. It's often worth looking at the beginning and the end of a Thomas poem, and you can kind of have a sense of the traje trajectory. The imperatives of the instincts in abeyance, oh, we drop, leading us through this circuitous route to the reversal of our values. I'll stop now, Mark. <laughs> It's, it's just wonderful to, to bathe in your enthusiasm for Thomas and, and to, for you to share what you're seeing with him. Thank you so much. Let's pause now. And if you'd like to unshare your screen. Yep. Um, uh, uh, we're going to go into Q&A now or comments. I'm sure there are people uh, in our audience who um, are fans of uh, R.S. Thomas. So um, let, let's uh, pause now for, uh, for a while. Um, and uh, can I invite people to... Uh, unmute themselves. If you'd like to put your hand up or um, indicate that you'd like to uh, ask a question, please do that. You can do that from the buttons on the bottom of your screen. Do you remember that we are being filmed? 
Um, so if you don't want to be filmed, uh, then just to turn off your uh, screen. And if you don't want to ask your question, but you've got one, write it in the chat and Susie will ask it for you. Uh, so uh, April, April Beckerley. Welcome, April. Hi, thank you so much. Um, that's just adorable. Lovely, <laughs> lovely. And uh, yeah, um, I I'm, uh, love R.S. Thomas poetry um, really resonated with it. Uh, my question is, um, I, I have, I will hold my hand up and say, I've come to R.S. Thomas probably through collected poems and, and sort of in a search for other poems. But, but I noticed tonight a lot of what you were talking about was from, well, from this book or this collection and naming them. Mm -hmm. um, I just wondered whether, it whether you'd want to sort of speak into approaching it from a from you know will we will will if if I go and you know buy myself a, a specific book will that give a different um perspective on his poems um do you mean a, a, a book about his poetry or a book of no, his a, a book so so I you know if you buy a sort of the later po or uh, you know yeah. all of the poems collected by somebody else yeah who, what what what's the different experience of buying um say you know the collections you've mentioned tonight which was frequencies or pieta or yeah. yeah well i think it's really worth getting i should have nabbed my uh, collected poems the two really big collections are very worth getting one is uh, rs thomas collected poems 1945 to 1990 well, and that gives you there there it is yeah. And that gives you a really good sweep of his work. And you do get a sense of the movement from poetry about the hill farm, hill farms yeah. and politics all the way through to his, his quite religious, very religious poetry. Mm. And that collection has got, um, I think, almost all of the poems from the collection frequencies in it. Um, so that's absolutely, you absolutely get the, the, the movement of his poetry. That's, yeah, I mean, that, that's the one I've got. But I, I was just interested in, in sort of whether, whether, you know, like reading a book, there is a different, um, yeah. But no, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And there's another really good collect. Well, there are two, just to mention briefly, there is the later collected poems published by Blood Axe. Um, and that again is a it's very it's, it's comprehensive and you get the sweep again and you get the sense of how his language changes so that's mm. worth looking at the only other collection I would mention is a collection that was published posthumously which I believe is a penguin collection and um, I should have rooted my copy out um, but I, the reason I mentioned that one is that it is a collect oh there it is yeah there it is Wendy's holding one up there that is um, a collection which R.S. Thomas himself um, compiled, in a sense, before he died. So that's a collection which you know represents something of what he considered to be um, poems that he wanted published. Thank you. Uh, thank you to David, who pointed out that I disabled the chat. It's now been re-enabled, so do feel free to write in the chat if you'd like to ask uh, another question or a comment about it poem of Thomas's. I'd like to raise a hand. Peter, yeah. Peter, please do. Uh, this might be a non-question, but how relevant do you think Thomas's poetry is to our situation now, you know, given all the uncertainty and the kind of the mood swings and the kind of almost near on depression that we're all feeling? Um, I mean, does, I know Thomas probably didn't care about being relevant in one <laughs> sense, but, but, you know, do, do you think he will resonate? I think you're right. I probably didn't care about being um, relevant, but I think he, I personally, I'm, ju I'm just casting around as I say this because, um, because I, you know, I think Thomas is a good thing. I think he is relevant. And the reason I do think he's relevant is he is a poet who could, who is equal to a mood which may not be all about straightforward prayer and praise. He is equal to our experience of lament. He's equal to a sense of, I mean, actually, if you read some of his poems, there's some quite interesting things he, he writes. He talks about um, 
things like discovering God in the blood's virus. So there is something about where he's able to give us a new perspective on God, which may not be one of the most natural or um, easy to, to manage emotionally. But somewhere in the middle of it, he's able to say uh, this God is still here. The vision still holds. Um, so I do think he's relevant. And um, I think there is a kind of courage about Thomas, which means that he is asking us to have a new vision, which, however difficult, enables us to grapple with God, even when the world looks like a bleak place. I think. Thank you. Thank you. I think that just to add to that as well, Karis, um, the way in which he tries to bring together science and mm -hmm. mysticism, science and prayer, mm -hmm. I, I think is has a particular um, it's a particular gift to today when it's very difficult to have those two in the same conversation. Mm -hmm. um, he, he shifts from using imagery from science. He mentioned the virus in the blood remarkably easy into talking about God. The title of your own your own book on Advent, Frequencies of God, I mean, there it is. Um, he, he inhabits those two realms in a way that many people find it much more difficult to do. Yeah, yeah. Yes, not that it was always easy for him, but he did mm. seek. Um, yeah, yeah. Some questions in the chat I'm noticing. Um, so there's a question from Mary and David Langshaw. Two questions. One was, did he write in Welsh? Hmm. And two is, any was any of his prose published? Um, no, not really to the first one, and yes, a lot to the second. So he, he well, I say he, he didn't write in Welsh. He didn't write poetry in Welsh. He discovered that he couldn't write poetry in Welsh, and that was a source of sadness to him. Uh, he learned it as an adult, and he never had the same natural poetic, I want to say facility, but he just didn't feel at home writing in Welsh. He did, however, write prose in Welsh, and um, uh, quite a, a famous uh, collection of his, which is, is now called Autobiographies, which was translated into English in the 1980s, is very worth reading. And that's got lots of prose pieces in it, including a quite a curious piece, which is called Neb, N-E-B, which uh, is, is one of his main autobiographical pieces. And the word Neb in Welsh means both somebody and nobody. And it's a sort of um, a nod at his own struggle with his own sense of identity. And that is very, very well, well worth reading, Neb. Um, so that, that is a piece of Welsh prose, which is left to us. He also wrote quite a lot of prose in English. The 1960s was a great decade of essays that he wrote, lots of essays about the nature of the poet. He wrote things called, uh, essays called things like a frame for poetry and words and the poet. And he reflected a lot in that decade in what it, on what it meant to be a religious poet. And he wrote, um, uh, articles on he wrote a, an article on David Jones he wrote introductions to books so there is quite a lot of Thomas prose which is well worth having a good old paddle about him and um, we've got some more questions in the chat coming through so um Edward Edward uh what says you mentioned that doubt is a motivating factor for Thomas but it seems from the poems you selected that he does actually explore ways to God. Would this be representative of his wider work? Yes, I think so. And um, I think where doubt is concerned, I think it's... Uh, he raises the question about how we understand God and he makes it really possible to ask questions about God's presence and also about God's way to humanity. One of the great poetic triggers for him was realizing that there were people in the communities in which he'd been set to minister who for generations had suffered incredibly in their life and work. 
And he started to ask a lot of questions about how do we understand the God who visits such hardness, hardship on people. So in that sense, there's doubt around um, a kind of an easy, an easy understanding of God and an invitation to us to explore uh, a kind of a wider economy of God. So when I use the word doubt, I think what I'm sort of suggesting is that we are allowed, in a sense, to fall off a cliff and ask us any ask any question we want to, because there is enough to hold us in that. Um, and his, his wider volume of work, I think, reflects this questing nature, this ability to see God in all sorts of different ways, with all sorts of different images, um, in absence as well as presence. So I think when I use the word doubt, I don't, exp I personally don't experience Thomas as saying, are you sure? Is he actually there or not? More, this is, whatever faith we have is so much bigger than we could possibly ever conceive that we can ask the utterly unaskable. So I think that's where I would kind of locate the doubt that appears in his work. Lovely. Um, so Mary uh, would like to know, when did he reach his most prolific period in his writing? Was that in Abadaron? And what is your sense of why? I think she means why his most prolific period was at that point. Yeah. He wrote uh, almost nonstop. He had, um, he started writing when he was, before he went to university, he used to write doggerel really when he was at university. He, he, he picked a kind of a schlock poet, poetic name. He called himself Curtis Langdon um, at first and he started writing uh, early on. So he wrote throughout. He was a very prolific writer throughout. Um, thematically, the, the great explosion, as I think of it in religious writing, did happen in the, in the 60s and into the 70s onwards. Um, the stuff that went on in the 70s, there is a kind of a why about it. And I think this relates back to his realization, Thomas, that he had less to worry about in terms of trying to carve out his own identity and he could become much more exploratory. So I think thematically things change. There was um, a much greater preponderance of religious poetry later on, uh, but he was very prolific all the way through. And he's, he's quite unusual in that he wrote squillions of short poems and hardly ever repeated himself. So there is just a sheer volume of poetry all the way through his life. Wow. <laughs> I'm a bit jealous. <laughs> um, Andrew uh, asks, can you tell us something about his personal writing discipline, please? All I know is what he wrote about. And um, any clergy in the room need to kind of have a sharp, sharp intake of breath at this point. He wrote a, poet, a poem in which he said something like, um, in the morning, um, he sits at his desk and writes. And in the afternoon, he walks the hills and watches birds. And in the evening, he goes visiting. And he considered himself to be fortunate indeed to be living a profession which gave him so much time to write. This was another world. Um, so that, that was his personal discipline, was he spent a chunk of his day every day writing. And he worked very hard at translating. He felt it was important for him to find language to translate his experience to make it accessible for others. And the way he wrote over time, he had an idea that some of the most mature poets were the ones with the most sophisticated ability to use adjectives effectively. And over time, his poetry became tighter um, so that it was less florid, less discursive and much more metaphoric and, and, and quite, I want to say dense, but I, I don't mean um, unbearable. I just mean words were very carefully compacted together so that meaning became um, very intense and each poem was a bit like a prism. And that was uh, over, over time. So he had a discipline when he did it and his style changed over time too. Amazing. I think we've got a question from Jane. 
Oh, yeah. Um, just to say that I am privileged to be the vicar of Manavan at the present time. And um, yeah, so, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and I discovered Thomas because I had to teach it. I'm not a poetry teacher. Um, and I was actually quite surprised that he was six miles up the road from the school at Manavan. Um, I wasn't ordained then. I became ordained. And I just wondered how much his congregations would have been aware of what he did and his poetry. Um, because I, I, sadly, I find that most people haven't a clue about Oris Thomas. Wife, and I sort of got really into him and got sort of really hooks on him. Yeah. Uh, and I just find it, it, it quite incredible that I, I see his picture on the wall every time I go to Manavan and know he's carved on the bell, hasn't he, and things like in the bell tower. And, and, and seeing his name in the books in church, thinking, wow, I, I'm following this man. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and there's no, I just feel sad that nobody knows. So is there a sense that he's being rediscovered now? Um, um, did they know about him and what he did? I think that I think this is really interesting. I think they did. I, the impression I got, and I could be well wrong about this, but the impression I got was because he was a little bit rude about some of his parishioners, especially in Manavon in the early yes. days. <laughs> okay. Was that I wondered if they kind of you know airbrushed him out a little bit at the time, um, <laughs> and of course they weren't. They didn't know about that until the poetry came out. I'm assuming he was quite pastoral in it. Well, I hope he was in encounters. Um, if you uh, hear about, I mean, I, I had some conversation with a couple of the vicars in Abadaron, so Evelyn Davis and Jim Cotter when yes. he was there. And there was much more of a sense of him there, I think. Um, and presumably, because his life in the community was different. He was a more famous figure at the time. But it's always possible, I guess, that Manavon has slightly lost touch yeah. with him, which is rather sad, isn't it? it is I, don't, I don't know what's happening at Egl in Egloise Vach, but there is a much more, there is a very conscious understanding of him in, in Abadaron. Um, Oh, you have to wave the R.S. Thomas flag. I'm sure you are. <laughs> I am. Well, I'm, I'm working. Yes, don't take time. But I'm, I'm working yeah. with the R.S. Thomas Society to try and do something in Manavan. Yes. Yeah, so. Oh right. Oh yeah. No, that. I mean, yes, of course. And he's um, such an important figure. But he, when he was there, he did struggle with this sense of um, these people are not who I think they should be. <laughs> until he arrived at a point where. He was shaped by his context. And I think that's really interesting about his time in Manavon, that he didn't leave with a miserable sense about him. He, he was, he, I think he had a real sense of loss when he went on to his next parish. He'd lost the inspiration that he had, um, he had acquired in a way from the Welsh hill farmers, that he, he'd learned such respect for them is my reading of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. And um, there's a couple of comments in the chat, which I'll just share with you. Robin says, in context, reminded me of Etty Hillisom's words. There doesn't seem to be much you yourself can do about our circumstances, about our lives. Neither do I hold you responsible. You cannot help us, but we must help you and defend your dwelling place inside us to the last. Mm -hmm. That's I'd never, I'd never put Thomas and Etty Hillisom together like that before, but that makes a lot of sense. For, and for those who don't know Etty Hillisom, this uh, remarkable woman who died uh, during the Second World War in a concentration camp, who um, was discovering she was on her own spiritual journey and this time of, of awakening whilst she was in the concentration camp and the, the writings that she left about this experience of even standing in a camp and looking around her and having a sense of gratitude, which seems utterly extraordinary. But thank you, that's a really interesting comment. Thank you, thank you very much. And Shona says, I've experienced RS Thomas for the first time tonight and I've experienced this as worship. Oh. So I thought you might like to hear that. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> He's a great companion. Yeah. Um, I hope I'm saying your name right. Apologies if I've mispronounced it. Maranu. Um, Maranu says, where he lived, looked across to Bardsey Island. Can you say a little about the landscape he looked onto? Mm. Um, yes. 
There is, if you go to Abadaron, there is a, a poem of his called The Other, which is carved into rock there, which is all about the pounding of the sea. And he looked out into the fairly wild uh, North Sea. I, I mean, as you can probably see from the picture, it's extremely beautiful, very ancient rock. And um, I think as a consequence of this, uh, the glorious um, seascape, and the uh, the wildness of it, there is sometimes a sense in his poetry of a of a primal, as a primal worshiping, going on. That this is a landscape bigger and greater than anything in in his experience. It is very beautiful. It is absolutely worth going to. It is freezing cold some of the time, and the wind pounds. And um, I believe, I believe Evelyn Davis, one of the former vicars of Abadaron, had a very significant part to play in making sure that the erosion of the coast stopped eating inland towards the church because the land was being eroded on that North Sea coast. Um, it's it's Precambrian rock. It's ancient, beautiful. A, a similar, a linked question, perhaps, um, oh, <laughs> and from Andrew, who he's just said, I think he's just answered my question, <laughs> was um, to what extent do you think the distinctly Welsh landscape influenced his poetry compared to Thomas Hardy's Wessex or the Brontes in Yorkshire? Well, I, I'm not sure whether it um, influenced his um, writing more or less than the others, but it was certainly a big part of his interior world. He was brought up near the sea. The sea had a very, played a very big part in his life. And so the landscape of the Welsh hills and then the coastline um, had a very profound impact on him. Um, so I think, it, I think it did. I think you can often almost hear the, the sound of the sea in his poetry mm. and, the, and the birds, the, the impact of the, the coming and going of the birds. I think he'd be a different poet in a different part of the country. Um, I'm just going to jump in with a little, uh, on my, I'm working on a dissertation at the moment for my master's and I want to look at the spirituality of the sea and the in kind of connection that people have with that. So do you think that he would have related to the coastline in that kind of, would he articulate a spirituality of the sea particularly, do you think? or? Um, I think he would draw on the sea for imagery. And um, there is uh, there is a poem which is kind of reminiscent of Dover Beach, but to my reading is um, more positive than Dover Beach. Um, there is a, a poem called Pilgrimages, which has a sense of traveling over the sea. Um, so I, th I think they are, he uses the sea and the soundscape of the sea um, very dramatically. So I think they are, he uses the sea as images for his spirituality, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Peter says, you said that he wasn't really interested in love and to ask his wife, mm -hmm. uh, but poems like A Marriage are simply breathtaking. Was he just pretending to not be interested? That's a really good question. Um, yeah, I mean, that was from an interview he gave. Um, I think it was one he gave um, on Radio 3 like donkeys years ago. He said something like, I'm not very good at this love business. Um, the, the poem A Marriage is, um, Thomas Hardy was mentioned earlier, and the poem A Marriage often reminds me of Thomas Hardy's poetry that he wrote after the death of his first wife, when, of course, there was this outpouring of love poetry. And A Marriage is... It's worth looking at. It's in the collected poems 1945 to 1990. It's a poem in which he reflects on um, a long, long, a long marriage. His first marriage lasted a very long time. And there's some beautiful lines in it about, um, he says something like, I closed my eyes and opened them on her wrinkles, I think, something like that. So you get this idea of, of time going by in a heartbeat. And it's very, very beautiful. Um, there are all sorts of stories about, um, I mean, they were a devoted couple, but there was seemed to be a distance. They lived in different parts of the house. She was a visual artist, a great visual artist in her own right. Her work ranged from minute nature drawings all the way through to uh, huge murals, which are still to be seen in parts of Wales. Um, so 
I don't doubt for a moment that um, they loved each other. I don't doubt that. But I think there was a distance about him and possibly, I don't know, a distance about her as well. Um, uh, they had one child, Gwydion, who has also died now. And Gwydion went away to school and then lived in the Far East for many years. So there was a kind of a distance there. Um, he, Thomas remarried in his 80s. And he married a lady called Betty. And Betty and her husband had been friends of Thomas and his wife for quite a long time. And when I mentioned seeing Donald Alchin earlier, and he's, he told me about one occasion when he'd been walking through the streets of Bangor and he'd come across Thomas and Betty and they had literally just got married. And he said he was just skipping around. So I don't think he was devoid of love, but he, he kind of didn't see himself as, um, as a love poet, he didn't see himself as a great sort of purveyor of love. Mm. Have we got time for one more? Quickly. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll have, we'll have to be pretty quick. <laughs> uh, from Paul. Paul asks, uh, do you think the absence and presence of God emphasised in some of his poems might express a panentheistic theology that poses the question, where is God not? Can you answer that quickly? Uh, we've got how long have we got to? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I kind of resist a sort of um, a panentheistic um, theology with Thomas. Um, I think his discussion of the absence and presence of God is more about our experience than a theological statement about, um, about who God is and where God is. I think a lot of his poetry is talking to the human experience of when we can't see or grasp God. Um, I mean, he uses uh, images like the untenanted cross, which um, kind of points us to both to the passion and to and to God's absence. So, and that I don't think is um, anything other than a way for us to understand our experience. So I think I slightly resist a sort of an ultimate statement uh, of, of, of God in that sense. Fabulous. Thank there you. Is, for those who would like to read a bit more, I think you've got a, a final slide with some suggested books. I do, beg your pardon. Let me... That's um, great. These are just some books of suggestions. Um, the Poetry of R.S. Thomas, the first one is a bit of a classic by John Ward. I think you'll need to share. Oh, I beg your pardon. That's all right. <laughs> yeah. Good thinking. Um, <laughs> Lovely. Okay. So the first one with the blue base, The Poetry of R.S. Thomas by John Ward. Um, it's getting on a little bit now, but that's a really good... Uh, basic work. Um, Echoes to the Amen, um, Essays After Thomas, edited by Damien Walford Davis, is one of the great Thomas scholars. That's um, a, a wonderful collection of essays. The Man Who Went Into the West is a, a good page turner, um, and that has involvement by Gwydion in it, his son. It's, it's, def it's worth a read. Um, I personally think Furious Interiors is really good by Justin Wintle. That's already getting a bit old. It's about 20 years old by now, that book. But that is, is I think, really good because Justin Wintle has a good handle on the religious stuff as well as the life stuff. And R.S. Thomas in the Writers of Wales series by Tony Brown is quite a slim volume and it's an introduction. And if you want a really slim volume, there's one by Barry Morgan, former Archbishop of Wales, called Strangely Orthodox as well. Thank you, that's absolutely brilliant. I'm just gonna stop your slides so that we can see everybody. Uh, can we uh, unmute ourselves and give Karis a, a, a warm round of applause uh, for an amazing introduction. Thank you for having me, it's been a pleasure.